Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're joining us on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. We'd appreciate it if you would like, comment, and subscribe to our channel for more videos on all things aphasia. This is Ask the Expert with Dr. Maya L. Henry. He'll be talking with us about maximizing communication and quality of life with primary progressive aphasia. She'll discuss the nature of PPA and how it disrupts communication and quality of life for persons with the diagnosis and their families. She'll also talk about treatment options, including interventions that target speech, language, communication, as well as counseling and care partner training. I'll be your moderator for this hour long session. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association. This year, we're celebrating 35 years of support, providing access to research, education, rehabilitation, therapeutic and advocacy services to individuals with aphasia and their care partners. On today's agenda, we'll be hearing from Dr. Maya L. Henry. Then we'll open the floor to those in our, um, open the floor to those in our live audience for questions. And now I'm honored to introduce our panelist, Dr. Maya Henry. Um, Maya serves as the Director of the Aphasia Research and Treatment Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Henry, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Jen. I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, hi everyone. I'm honored to be here to talk with you today about primary progressive aphasia. Um, as Jen said, uh, I am faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm in the departments of speech language and hearing sciences and neurology. And my primary clinical and research focus is on primary progressive aphasia. Um, what I'd like to do today is kind of give a general overview of what PPA is, what it looks like, um, how it progresses, talk a bit about treatment options and other supports that we can provide to persons with PPA and their families. And then I'd like to be sure to save plenty of time for questions at the end. So I wanna start just briefly by defining aphasia. Um, everyone may know what that word means, but you may not. Um, and aphasia just means an acquired impairment of language. Most speech language pathologists like myself encounter people with aphasia in the context of stroke. So people have normal speech and language, they suffer a stroke, and then they experience a rather sudden loss of, of communication ability. Um, and then over time, they may recover slightly or plateau, but they tend to remain pretty stable um, unless there's another neurological event of some kind. Primary progressive aphasia is different in that we see a gradual decline in language and or speech, and PPA isn't caused by a stroke. It's caused by brain cell degeneration, um, caused by potentially several different types of disease in the brain. There are three different types of PPA that you may have heard about. You may have been given a diagnosis of one of these different types, and I know that that terminology can be somewhat confusing. Um, basically what these different subtypes mean, uh, they, they, they sort of summarize the different kinds of features, speech and language difficulties that we see. Um, and these different subtypes are associated with different patterns of change in the brain. And you can see that in this image at the right, where people with the non-fluent variant of PPA who have trouble with motor speech and with speaking in correct and complete sentences tend to have changes in the left frontal lobe. People diagnosed with the semantic variant of PPA tend to have trouble with retrieving words and also comprehending what those words mean. And we see changes in the left anterior temporal lobe, which you see here in blue. And people diagnosed with the logopenic variant of PPA, and by the way, logopenia is just a not very helpful term from neurology that means uh, not saying very many words. Um, these are people who have trouble with um, assembling sounds for speech and processing sounds and holding on to information that they've heard. We call that phonological processing. And we see that in the context of changes in the left temporal parietal region, which you see here in green. And as I mentioned, each of these patterns tends to be associated with a different pattern of atrophy in the, in the brain or change in the brain, but also with a different type of disease. So for example, the logopenic variant is associated with the kind of pathological 
process that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So what does primary progressive aphasia look like? Early on, most people complain of not being able to find words. I know what it is, but I just can't say it. Uh, and when they try to say words, the words may come out wrong. So dog instead of cat, or the sounds in the words may be switched around. So bog instead of dog. Some people will have difficulty remembering the concepts. So not just knowing how to say the word pencil, but not recognizing the word when they hear it, or even sometimes recognizing the object when they see it. Some will have trouble speaking in correct and complete sentences and their language may become what we describe as telegraphic. So my house and son and dinner, where the elements of the sentence have sort of fallen away. Some people have trouble coordinating the muscles of articulation. So their speech may sound slurred or be less intelligible. Some will have a hard time remembering information that they've just heard. So I've so for example, if I said a phone number and you had to walk across the room to write that phone number down, you might have trouble holding on to those numbers in your head. And most will have some trouble with reading and writing because reading and writing actually rely on the same core language processes as spoken language. What is not affected in primary progressive aphasia? Well, at least early on, people's memory for events their reasoning, their sense of humor and general intelligence, sense of direction and spatial abilities, artistic abilities. And in fact, sometimes we see a new emergence of or new aptitudes for different types of art and physical skills. So dancing, riding a bike, running, et cetera. As PPA progresses, speaking will typically become increasingly difficult and also understanding what others have to say. Additionally, people may start to have trouble with things that aren't speech and language. So memory, attention, other cognitive functions, um, abnormal behaviors may emerge, and also motor impairments that aren't motor speech, but more general motor changes. So what are researchers doing in the area of primary progressive aphasia? There's a great deal of research underway. Um, some of the things that researchers are working on are trying to understand the specific disease processes like Alzheimer's um, or tauopathies, um, FTD, other types of FTD proteinopathies, um, which of those are associated with different types of PPA, what parts of the brain are affected, and probably most relevant to many people in this audience, what types of treatments may help. So medical or pharmacological treatments, there are drug trials underway, uh, none that have as of yet shown really promising results, unfortunately. But also researchers like me are studying behavioral treatments. In other words, treatments for speech and language or speech therapy. And actually a number of different speech and language treatment interventions have shown a great deal of promise. So this is my primary uh, area of research. Um, and I was drawn to this research because 20 years ago, when I started learning about PPA, there was very little research. And most people that I encountered who'd been diagnosed with PPA were not referred for speech therapy, which I thought was a real shame. What kind of tools do speech language pathologists have for persons with aphasia? We have different types of interventions. So restorative treatments that are really designed to rebuild lost skills aided approaches where we equip a person with tools and strategies to help them to circumvent problems with spoken language, for example. And then em environmental supports and communication partner training. We're really focusing on the environment and the other people in the person's environment to help them to support communication with the person with aphasia. I'll focus first on describing what some restorative treatments look like. So one of the interventions that we use in my lab with people who have PPA is called script training. The script training is sort of tried and true from, uh, from aphasia research with persons who've had strokes. 
And basically what we do in script training is to develop and rehearse functional scripted information to help facilitate communication about important topics. And the person with aphasia can then use that scripted content to help as a springboard for additional conversation. We tailor the scripts to the person's individual needs and abilities, so relatively easier scripts for people who have more trouble with communication, or hard, complex, and long scripts for those um, with relatively minor difficulties with communication. And we give them practice videos to help them rehearse saying their scripts at home. Um, this practice video is uh, very similar to an approach that was pioneered by NAA's own Darlene Williamson. So happy to acknowledge um, and give credit there. You might be wondering what kinds of benefits people, uh, people may see in the context of treatment because as we know, people are tending to get worse over time with PPA. So what happens when you intervene with speech and language treatment? So these are some data from a study that we've conducted with, at, at this point, over 30 people with non-fluent PPA. So these are people who have trouble with speech production and speaking in correct and complete sentences. And they've learned scripts. Um, and they go from, here you can see at pre-treatment in green, these are trained scripts. So scripts that they worked on in therapy. They go from being about 40% accurate to above 80% accurate. So they're able to learn these scripts and produce them intelligibly. And the really impressive thing I think is that people are able to maintain these gains up to one year post-treatment. And we see that even on untrained scripts, people are remaining pretty stable. So these are topics that we ask people to talk about over time that we haven't trained. So while there was initially a lot of pessimism, and there still is uh, in the general clinical community about how useful speech and language therapy might be for people with PPA, we see really pretty impressive results. Another type of restorative treatment is naming treatment. So many people with PPA complain of word finding difficulty, just not being able to get their words out. So we work on naming or word retrieval by asking people to practice words that are important to them. And in the context of that practice, we train them on strategies for what, the, what they can do when they get stuck in any conversation, not just with that word that they're trying to target. So for example, when they get stuck, they can try to describe the item. They can try to come up with the first letter or the first sound. And what we see is that when people do that, oftentimes they can self-cue or, or, or produce the word after generating this kind of conceptual information or word form information. And our treatment outcomes over time in people with logopenic and semantic variants of PPA who have significant trouble with word finding show that people not only can relearn vocabulary, but that those gains are maintained over time to some extent. So one year post-treatment, they're still well above where they were at pre-treatment. So again, this is counter to the notion that people with PPA can't improve and that they can't maintain those gains over time. So the message that we're trying to send to the clinical and research communities is that speech and language therapy can and should be um, offered to people with PPA, that, that that should be a given and not the exception. So thus far, I've focused on spoken language treatments. As PPA progresses, spoken language is going to become more difficult people tend to experience a decrease in communicative participation. They tend to withdraw from communication situations because they're difficult and stressful and conversations become increasingly unbalanced. In this context, we tend to focus more and more on aided approaches and these kinds of ex external supports. It's not that we abandon working on spoken language, in fact, Ideally, we're working on all of these things throughout the course of PPA. Aided approaches allow us to put the person's vocabulary visually in front of them so that they can easily access it. And this can take many different forms from low-tech options like communication books and communication boards that can be homemade to much more high-tech options like 
dedicated speech generating devices or apps that can be installed on smartphones. The important thing to remember with technology is that it's not appropriate for everyone. So trying to introduce new and complex technology to someone who has PPA may not be very fruitful, but taking advantage of skills that they already have with technology and technology that they're already comfortable with can be really useful. Okay, in terms of environmental support and partner training, there are a number of studies underway looking at training not just the person with PPA, but their communication partners. Um, this study, which is currently underway and we're anxiously awaiting um, the results, um, involves a training approach where persons with PPA and their care partners are, uh, they receive individualized treatment that's geared toward um, maximizing communicative success. So minimizing the barriers and working on strategies to promote communication within that particular dyad. There are actually a number of published studies that address care partner training in PPA, not enough studies, but I will say that practicing speech language pathologists consider this a very, very important priority, recognizing that we can't focus just on the person with aphasia, that we need to think about their whole communication environment and provide as much support as possible. We also recognize that PPA doesn't just affect speech and language, that it affects the whole person and their family and their friends. And so counseling is an important part of the, the, the care continuum in PPA. Um, this is a study from my lab where my doctoral student, Kristen Schaefer, Schaefer has paired speech and language treatment with uh, a specific counseling approach sort of embedded in the speech and language treatment. And so we're exploring new models for combining speech language therapy and counseling. Beyond one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, group treatment and support groups are incredibly important resources. Um, and we encourage people to seek local support groups or virtual support groups. And the Association for Frontotemporal Dementia has uh, a website with um, some resources for, for finding support groups near you. Uh, if you are near an academic medical center, um, you may have support groups that can even meet in person. So Northwestern University, uh, UCSF, the University of Texas, we all offer support groups. So I encourage you uh, to see what's available nearby. And if not nearby, uh, Zoom allows us to see people all over the country and, and that certainly has its benefits as well. Okay, I wanna wrap up cr pretty quickly here to save time for questions, but um, I, I wanted to touch on some strategies for what communication partners can do to support communication. This is a helpful um, acrostic from the NAA website actually. Uh, that reminds us of some specific things that we can do to support communication, like asking simple direct questions, um, helping a person to communicate if they're asked, speaking slowly and clearly, very important, allowing extra time for communication. Just a couple of other things that I'll remind you about. Um, avoid speaking on someone's behalf unless it's absolutely necessary. Use multimodal communication and encourage the person with aphasia to do so and be positive about attempts to communicate, not focusing on errors or testing. Multimodal communication means using all the modes available to you, gesture, writing, drawing a picture, facial expressions. The person with aphasia can use these strategies and so can you to help support your own communication and to show them that this is a normal way to communicate and that it works. If the person with aphasia gets stuck, encourage them to talk around the word to describe it. Um, even an incomplete description can be helpful. So, you know, it's the thing that you write with. It has ink. When I say that, you know, that I'm probably talking about a pen. So this provides important information to the listener, but also can help the person with PPA to come up with the word in some cases. Remember that fatigue affects communication, so save important discussions for a time when the person is well rested. Importantly, realize that communication abilities can be inconsistent. Just because a person could say something today doesn't mean that they'll be able to say it tomorrow. 
And then I want to end with some advice that I received from a, a seasoned PPA care partner. He said this, just don't use so many words when you communicate with the person with PPA. Engage with them physically, with gestures and emotions, and show your exception, acceptance and appreciation non-verbally. This care partner felt strongly that he should train new communication partners regarding how to communicate with his wife. And so he was very explicit in giving them direct advice in the best way to communicate with her. You may not feel comfortable doing that or having your partner do that, but I thought it was an interesting approach. And then lastly, and I think this is incredibly important, he said, understand that your approach to communicating with and relating to the person with PPA must evolve and sometimes rapidly. And he described this as kind of akin to standing on shifting sand and needing to find new balance every day. And I really appreciated that perspective and thought, you know, he had better insight than I probably ever could being someone who, who, who really was there um, supporting his, his wife's journey. Okay, I want to uh, share some information about my lab. Um, we offer telerehabilitation to people all over the country as part of our NIH funded clinical trial. Um, we do some of the treatments that I have described for you today and some others. You can go to our website, feel free to email us or visit clinicaltrials.gov if you'd like to learn more. I also have some resource links here, starting with the NAA's uh, page on top, which is incredibly helpful, and some additional resource pages from other groups that I think are useful. And maybe I will leave this up, uh, Jen, if you think that is a good idea and we can take some questions. Sure, actually, um, can you, I'm gonna switch over to my screen, um, but maybe we can come back to this screen at the end of the session. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much for such comprehensive information on PPA. It's wonderful to hear so much about PPA. Um, I'm going to switch over to my screen and jump right into the questions. I just want to make sure everyone can see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our first question is, are PPA and frontal lobe dementia the same? Are they treated the same? That's a great question. You know, I was just chatting with Jen before we got started about how one of the things that I think that people diagnosed with PPA and their care partners um, really struggle with is all of the terminology, which is incredibly confusing. So what is PPA relative to Alzheimer's, relative to FTD and FTLD? Um, and uh, so I'll try to unpack that just a little bit. Um, primary progressive aphasia, as I mentioned, is sort of made up of different subtypes. And two of those subtypes also fun fall under the category of frontotemporal dementia. So the non-fluent variant of PPA and the semantic variant of PPA are also part of the spectrum of, of FTD or frontotemporal dementia syndromes. So there's some overlap, whereas the logopenic variant of PPA is actually a language prominent manifestation of Alzheimer's disease. So, um, they're not, so PPA and FTD or frontal lobe dementia or frontotemporal dementia, I should say, are not exactly the same, but there is some overlap. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, so um, the language variants of frontotemporal dementia uh, are treated in the way that I described. So with the kinds of interventions that I've described, I will mention that there's also a behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia that is caused predominantly by frontal lobe changes. And those individuals have um, a different kind of difficulty that's not so much language-based, but more uh, a change in behavior and personality. And so the, the treatments for, for behavioral variant FTD are, are actually quite different. They're focused more on managing those behaviors, but that's a great question. Our next question is, can a person who has aphasia from stroke be later diagnosed with PPA and how common is this? Another good question. Um, so a person who's 
got aphasia, who has aphasia caused by stroke, could ultimately develop primary progressive aphasia. Um, it's not something that I've seen. I have seen people who've had strokes, uh, minor strokes that didn't cause lasting changes in language who then ultimately developed PPA. Um, so, so it can happen. I would say it's fairly uncommon, um, but it's important to keep in mind that these really are two separate processes that the, the aphasia caused by stroke um, would, would uh, certainly confer some added challenges once a person starts to, to develop PPA, but in terms of what's going on the in the brain, um, it's not like the stroke-induced aphasia is causing PPA in any way. Oops. Our next question is, who would I speak to about medication for PPA? I know you talked a little bit about that in your presentation. Sure. I, I think it's, uh, it's always appropriate to ask your neurologist for their impressions. Um, and particularly, I would encourage you to seek um, a neurologist who has some experience with dementia and, and atypical dementias like PPA if you can. Um, there are also drug trials underway that you may be eligible for as a person diagnosed with PPA. Um, you can look through the, for those through clinicaltrials.gov. You can also reach out to one of the major uh, PPA FTD uh, research centers. So at UCSF, um, you could reach out to me in my lab. We're not doing clinical trials, but we're linked into those networks. Um, uh, Mass General, UCLA, um, these are all places where they have major research centers and trials going on. Great. I'm going to stop the share because I have a few live questions. Sure. Um, my first live question is, do you have any advice on how to work with a PPA client who has strong <clears throat> sorry, perseveration when reading and writing? Strong perseveration when reading and writing specifically. So perseveration, for those who don't know what that means, is sort of getting stuck on a word. Um, and finding it difficult to move on. So I'm assuming what this means is if a person is trying to write um, a word, they may get stuck on that word and be unable to move on to a different word that they're trying to write. Same thing with reading. Um, in terms of advice for how to deal with that, I guess it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish with working on reading and writing. Um, one thing that I recommend is always pair, if you're working on writing, um, always keep keeping a picture present of whatever it is that you're trying to target that can keep the person grounded in that concept. Um, so an added visual support. Um, beyond that, it would be, it's hard for me to say without knowing more about kind of what the treatment is really focused on uh, in, in terms of kind of functional communication. Great, thank you. Um, our next live question, my brother has PPA, talking on the phone is becoming more and more frustrating for the person with primary, pr primary progressive aphasia um, and for family members. Should we try to limit communications to short durations? Mm, that's, a, that's also a really good question. The phone is notoric, notoriously difficult for people who have aphasia and certainly for people with PPA as well. Um, and, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, when we talk on the phone, we can't see a person's face and the face provides a lot of added support for comprehension. Um, also the auditory signal that we're hearing is degraded. So no, we're not hearing all of the same sounds that we would be hearing if we were communicating with a uh, face to face with a person. Uh, some people may find that having a Zoom call is actually um, easier than talking on the phone because you do have some of those visual supports. Um, the, the, the question asker, asker inquired about keeping conversations short, and I do think that can be a good idea. That fatigue is definitely an issue, um, and the more fatigued a person feels, the more likely they are to struggle with communication. Um, so keeping a conversation concise and taking cues from the person with PPA about when it's time to wrap things up is just fine. 
but also exploring new ways to communicate like with text or short emails, not, nothing that necessarily requires writing, you know, long passages, but, um, but short texts and emails or even sharing of pictures can be great. So sending a photo instead of trying to uh, compose a verbal message can be a great way to communicate. And we all do it all the time. So it's very, you know, it's very normal. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, has there been any research on whether or not providing cognitive therapy in conjunction with speech and language tasks is valuable? For example, working memory and attention tasks. Good question. Um, there has been some work done in looking at remediating cognitive processes, either in isolation or in conjunction with language treatment, more so in uh, stroke-induced aphasia. Um, in the context of PPA, uh, I believe that there has been a little bit of work done in this area. So working on, and I, I'm, I'm not able to, to remember the details of a specific study, but working on cognitive strategies, not in isolation, but in conjunction with language treatment, and, and that that did show some benefit. Um, I would, uh, and I, I think it's worthwhile to think about. I guess I would caution against using, um, training people on cognitive tasks that aren't functional. Um, and always, if you're working on, on cognitive tasks and language tasks, trying to incorporate one with the other um, and really staying focused on functional targets and goals, not tra training some um, abstract task with the goal of, for example, trying to rebuild memory or rebuild executive function, but rather working on everyday activities that draw upon those functions. Um, that makes sense to me. Uh, there's not a great deal of research in that, in that kind of treatment though. Great, I'm gonna go back to my screen. Can you see the question? I can. Great, so the question is, are there any foods or drinks we should avoid if we have PPA? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, what I would say though, is that some persons with PPA may ultimately develop difficulty with swallowing, which is referred to as dysphagia. Um, the, the muscles of speech and articulation overlap with those that we use for eating and swallowing. And so sometimes we'd see changes in swallowing. Um, and in that case, a person may need to modify their diet. So if the person with PPA starts to experience choking or coughing or gurgly voice after they're eating, then they may need to be seen for a swallowing assessment. Swallowing assessments are done by speech language pathologists and then the speech pathologist can make a recommendation about whether they need to modify their diet. Um, and the reason for doing that is if you are getting food or liquid into your airway and into your lungs, it can cause pneumonia. It actually, it, 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 can, it can be quite dangerous. So with regard to eating and drinking, I would say, no, don't avoid anything other than if it's, if it's causing difficulty with swallowing. And in that case, uh, seek an evaluation. Thank you. Our next question is, how can I find a speech language therapist in my area that works specifically with persons living with PPA? Yeah, good question. Um, websites like the NAA's website um, have resources for locating clinicians. Um, in my lab, we are always interested in enrolling folks for treatment who we can. Um, and when we can't, we try to help them find a local clinician and we're happy to do that. So um, visiting uh, the AFTD's website or the NAA's website to try to look for their sort of, and actually ASHA's website as well. They have sort of a clinician finder tool where clinicians can actually indicate their areas of expertise and whether they uh, see persons with PPA. So this is the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Um, can, can be a really nice resource for that as well. Uh, and then if you're, if you're struggling, we're also happy to help. Um, so, so don't hesitate to reach out to my lab. 
Thank you. Our next question, actually, sorry, before I go on to this next question, we had a follow-up question in our chat. Um, this person says that she's from a small town and it's very difficult to find a speech language pathologist who is even familiar with PPA. Um, I know you talked a bit about doing online programs, but is there any training available for speech therapists that this person can recommend? Training available for the speech therapist? Yes. There are a number of webinars, in, including several. Um, a, so a webinar, uh, webinars done by ASHA, um, again, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, um, the AFTD. Many of these are available on YouTube. ASHA may require a fee uh, because this is continuing education. I've done an ASHA webinar on treatment for persons with PPA. I don't know that that training is sufficient. I think that ideally um, you're gonna wanna look for someone with real hands-on experience, um, but there are pro professional trainings available. Um, one thing that I'll say though, is that if you're looking for a clinician who can help with PPA, it's important that they have experience working with people with aphasia. It's important that they, perhaps that they have experience working with people with dysarthria or apraxia of speech, the motor speech impairments that can come along with the language impairments that we see in PPA. And if they have that kind of experience, they may be able to help even if they don't have specific experience with PPA. Um, what's really important is that you find a good clinician um, with whom you can work well and relate and, um, and that may actually trump specific experience with PPA. I think you're muted, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share the National Aphasia Association's website um, just so everyone knows where we can find these, this information. Sorry, this is Ashen. This is the National Aphasia Association's website. If you scroll down a little bit um, and you see this blue square to find support, this can um, help you find maybe what you're looking for. And then Dr. Henry also mentioned ASHAB's website, which is just www.asha.org. Okay, Thanks, another, thank you. <laughs> another live question is a family member with PPA is a resident in an, in an assisted living facility that does not seem to have any staff uh, with knowledge about PPA. Will a therapist that only comes once a week help? Recommendations how we can as a team, how, sorry, recommendations on how we can uh, work as a team with faculty and staff. So this is written by a person who has a loved one in a facility? Yes. Okay, and the question is about how the family can work with faculty and staff to best support the person who's living there who has PPA? Uh, so the first question is, will a therapist that only comes once a week help or be helpful? Okay. Um, and then the second question is, do you have any recommendations on, I guess, how to facilitate getting more help for this person? Mm -hmm. I think that some interaction with a speech language pathologist is better than no interaction with a speech language pathologist. And so having a person come once a week is important, especially if the time that's spent with that clinician really is focused on strategies for maximizing communication for that person in their environment. And what that can mean is not just working with the person with PPA, but working with all the caregivers as well. So helping to educate the caregivers, the staff, about uh, the best modes for communication so visual supports, using multimodal communication, modifying their communication style to best support the person with PPA. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I think can be a really nice tool is developing a personalized communication book with um, personal information about the individual with PPA, always supported by pictures and written words. So just single written words. Um, in addition, function, functional vocabulary, so pages with things that they like to eat, um, 
items of clothing, um, information about their past, so their career, information about their present, so their family, their grandkids. These visual supports can provide a really helpful kind of tool for communication and they don't require a ton of training. So um, developing a personalized communication book is something that a speech pathologist can work with the person with PPA to do. And then the, the family can help to keep it up to date, to add pages, remove pages. Um, and this is really low tech. So uh, really is just a compilation of pictures and words, but the speech pathologist should be able to provide support for doing that. And then again, just um, providing education and guidance for staff about how to communicate with the person with PPA. And this is something that the family can ask for and advocate for. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about going back to work with PPA? Sure, sure. Uh, many people with PPA are still working. Um, one of the devastating things about PPA is that people can be diagnosed very young. Uh, sometimes as young as their 40s, uh, in their 50s and their 60s. So, so many individuals are still working. Some people with PPA still have kids living at home. Um, and, you know, at early in the diagnosis, it may be the case that the person with PPA still feels very comfortable going to work. And it depends on many, many factors, like the nature of their job. Um, so how communication heavy it is. Um, and, and kind of where they are in their PPA journey. So what kinds of difficulties that they are having. Um, this is a very personal choice and a very, uh, uh, that, that involves not just the person with PPA, but families as well. Um, and, and so the, I, you know, the, the question about going back to work, um, I guess, assumes that some time has been taken away from work and that a person may be wanting to return to work after receiving a diagnosis. Um, I, I think this is possible, uh, but that, that the person should, um, should really consider uh, what's gonna help them to maximize their quality of life with the time that, that they have, um, but also recognizing that there are financial constraints on many families that can make people want to work. Um, but, but I think it's important for, for families to be supportive as well um, and to seek help through, uh, through counseling or, for example, social workers who can help families to navigate this kind of decision making. Um, but certainly there's no reason why a person diagnosed with PPA can't work as long as they feel comfortable um, that they can complete their duties and, and as long as they, they have good awareness about what their limitations are. Um, and if they don't have good, good awareness of what their limitations are, then that can be a particularly challenging situation where families might need to seek additional help and support to, to, help, um, to help navigate that process. A similar question that we received was um, asking if you could talk a bit about driving with PPA. Mm -hmm. Sure. Depending on where a person lives, if they receive a diagnosis of dementia um, and PPA is, is a language prominent manifestation of dementia, um, they may have to undergo a driving evaluation. Um, it, it may be required by law. That's not the case everywhere. Um, I think that Making the decision not to drive, whether that's motivated by the concerns that the person with PPA has or that the family has or that the physician has is a very, very hard choice. Um, it's a, a potential loss of independence, um, a very significant one. And so it's a, you know, it, it, it's a, a very weighty decision for, for people with PPA and their families. Um, the kinds of considerations that we have to take into account are I mean, uh, whether there are any changes in cognitive or motor function that go along with the language impairment that we're seeing. Um, and it, it, it is often the case that uh, there are subtle changes that may make, even early on, driving less safe. Um, and I'm not just talking about issues with navigating, but sensory and motor changes um, and cognitive changes. The other, th you know, other things to be concerned about are what would happen if the person with PPA gets pulled over and they have difficulty with communicating with people about what's going on. 
Um, and we certainly wouldn't want the person with PPA to end up in a situation where, uh, you know, where, where there's a possibility that somebody might get hurt, either themselves or other people on the road. And so we want to, we want to be cautious. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, speech pathologists, thank goodness, are not the ones making this decision. Um, but physici physicians often are going to weigh in um, and may recommend a driving evaluation. Um, and a driving evaluation can be a, a you know a semi-objective means of of helping to decide if driving is still a good idea. Um, but the fact of the matter is, at a certain point, it's not going to be safe for a person to drive any longer, um, and that uh, that's going to be a very sort of different um, scenario for each individual, and they're going to have to negotiate that with their own family and in their own life. But it's, I acknowledge it's a very, very difficult, um, it's a very, very difficult decision and a difficult change that people have to face. Thank you so much. I'm going to go back to my shared screen. And I see someone, I'm just looking at the chat as well, Jen, someone commenting, commenting that they've been told by a doctor at UCSF that they shouldn't be driving. Um, and, and, and this person feeling like they, they still drive quite well. And, and that's, uh, that's really hard to hear. And I, I can certainly appreciate that it would be, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so it feel, this question asks, it feels like biannual neurological visits are insufficient. However, I'm led to believe there isn't much to be done between visits. Should I be seeking help outside of our biannual neurological consults? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and again, I think um, the answer is a very, it, it, it's is that this is very individualized and depends on where a person is. So uh, the person with PPA may feel like they're in a period of relative stability um, where speech and hopefully they have access to speech and language treatment, but they don't necessarily feel like they need a lot of input, frequent input from a neurologist, especially if medications are under control and any sort of symptoms that are problematic are, are under control. So for example, people may experience um, anxiety or depression in conjunction with PPA, and there may be medications that, that can be helpful. Um, so, so certainly finding a good neurologist who can help to navigate um, any medications that might be beneficial um, can be a really good idea. But, but yes, when, it, when a person is in a period of relative stability, there may not be uh, there may not be much to, to, to require them. There may not be a compelling reason for them to go see the neurology neurologist more frequently. Um, but certainly if the person is experiencing any kinds of changes, um, cognitively or linguistically, um, I recommend that they reach out and try to be, try to be seen by the neurologist, but also by a speech language clinician who can help to think about whether they're, uh, whether there are new things that should be incorporated into their care. So given the fact that communication challenges are going to evolve over time, it's not sufficient to see a speech language pathologist once and then you know, graduate from treatment and, and assume that a person has all of the tools that they're need, they'll need. And so what we recommend to clinicians is that there are periodic assessments followed up by booster doses of treatment um, and so it's the same sort of idea that, that uh, clinicians are sort of reliant on persons with PPA to let us know, hey, things are changing. I need some, I need some more help. And I think that, that that's the case um, in the context of neuro neurological care as well. Our next question asks, what can I do when my family member living with PPA does not recognize that they're deteriorating? Is, the is this common with persons living with primary progressive aphasia? Yeah, this is really, really hard. Um, and it is something that we see um, that while I, I think the majority of people with PPA are very, very aware of their communication challenges and of any progressing changes over time, there are people who don't have good insight. 
they don't recognize that they're having difficulty and they may not recognize that, that things are getting worse over time. And that presents a significant challenge for, for families, but also treat, treating speech language pathologists. Um, what's not productive is trying to convince somebody that something is wrong um, from my experience. So uh, as a clinician, I don't feel like it's my responsibility to, to try to convince someone that they're having difficulty with language, but I try to provide supports and strategies for them regardless. And I think that families can, can ap approach this in a sort of a similar way. Um, rather than feeling like it's your responsibility to convince the person that they're deteriorating, um, even wor working with a clinician to think about what kinds of supports can be provided for communication and for other skills uh, that can help to maximize their functioning, um, I think can, be, can still be productive without great insight. But what this means is that we really are viewing care for the person with PPA and treatment not just as focused on the person with PPA, but on the whole um, communication environment and context and the other people that they're interacting with. But yes, it is something that we see in PPA that, that there can be lack of insight. Our next question is, as a communication partner, what can I do to help my partner living with PPA understand WH questions? I've tried speaking and writing the question. Hmm. So, peep, so, so WH questions are particularly challenging. Um, I guess my question would be whether WH questions, whether the WH words are, are truly critical. Um, I don't think it would be particularly productive to try to train someone on WH words. So I would try to get creative about asking questions that aren't requiring um, WH words. So giving a person two visual choices to choose from if you want them to make a selection, rather than saying, which of these do you want? Um, providing them with logos of two different stores rather than asking them, where do you want to go? I think visual supports are key. Um, and so maybe trying to shift so much away from a reliance on those tricky WH words um, and think creatively about using other modalities to support uh, the communication would, would potentially be productive. Oh, you're, you're muted, Jen. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on today. Um, so the next question is, as a communication partner, it can be challenging to get the attention of my partner living with PPA when I call her or his name. Any advice? Yeah, so um, one thing to, to try would be uh, to avoid uh, really distracting environments to minimize auditory distractions and other distractions when you're trying to communicate um, and to avoid, for example, calling from across the house. That, I mean, this is just good strategy for, for communicating with persons with aphasia that you can approach them and communicate face-to-face uh, -face rather than trying to reach them from across the house. And particularly if there are any distractions, trying to minimize those distractions. Uh, if you're trying to get somebody's attention. Thank you so much. And we are almost out of time. So I just wanted to quickly ask if you had any last thoughts or um, any big takeaways for our audience members. Sure, sure. Well, I, I guess my big takeaway is that um, I and other speech language pathologists fully acknowledge that, that PPA is devastating and life-changing. Um, but, but I think there is cause for hope in the sense that the state of, of the clinical science of PPA care has improved immensely um, over the last couple of decades. And we now have a number of treatment options focused on speech and language that really are showing potential benefit. And just as exciting, we're seeing that in the research world, 
um, clinicians and clinical researchers are investigating interventions to support not just communication, but well-being in PPA. Um, so, so counseling and partner training, as I mentioned in my talk, being just as important and realizing that we need to be thinking beyond just the person with aphasia and their language problem, but really thinking about their quality of life and the well-being of their loved ones as well. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about, even in the context of this really uh, devastating disorder. Dr. Maya Henry, thank you so much for being here with us today and for helping us learn more about primary progressive aphasia. Um, and to our audience, thank you for being here with us. Uh, those of you who are joining us on YouTube, we would sincerely appreciate if you would like, comment, and subscribe. For more information on aphasia and the National Aphasia Association, uh, please visit us at www.aphasia.org slash online events. We also encourage you to visit the Aphasia Research Center, sorry, the Aphasia Research and Treatment Labs. Let me put that website up there. Um, so you should see on your screen, Dr. Maya Henry's lab. Um, and we, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at jenaphasia.org. Um, we also have some upcoming Ask the Expert web webinars on March 10th. We have a conversation with Jenny Rook about music therapy and communication. And on March 31st, a conversation with Michael Obel Omiya about his book, Finding My Words, Aphasia Poetry. The National Aphasia Association also has some amazing online groups. Um, we have a book club that is starting a new book uh, next week, um, and that meets every Thursday at noon Eastern time. And we have a Spanish version coming out soon. So if you speak Spanish and wanna read Spanish books, please uh, keep your eyes open for that. We have a group called Professionals with Aphasia Connect. This is a peer-led conversation group for people with aphasia. And we're also starting an aphasia ambassador program. So if you want to get more active in educating others about aphasia, this is the program for you. Um, you can always email me at jen at aphasia.org uh, for more information on that.